In the remote reaches of New Mexico, a band of scientists are taking a wildly different approach to the problem of robot intelligence. They are attempting to use the young science of chaos theory to create living machines. This is the robotic face of a field called artificial life. Dr. Chris Langton is considered the father of artificial life. He builds simulated organisms inside his computer and watches them evolve. Langton and his colleagues are trying to unravel the mystery of how life is created. The molecular biology of the last uh, 40 years or so has given us a very good understanding of how the uh, lowest level bits and pieces of uh, biological organisms work. What we do not have a very good understanding of yet is how all of those pieces work together to form one big organism. Uh, computers uh, have really given us the tool to understand how a whole organism is synthesized. Yeah, it's been for desert the world's prettiest design. The mechanical insects created by engineer Mark Tilden and physicist Brossel Haslager are the first machines to apply the theories of artificial life to robots. These machines are all reflexes and no brains. Unlike conventional robots, they are not driven by digital technology. Their spark comes from the analog patterns of nature. How many transistors on this? A uh, total of about 60. So, barely enough on this thing to make a good decent video. The interesting thing between my technology and other types of roboticist technology is based upon the digital versus analog uh, design aspects. My devices do in 12 transistors what many people can't do in 12 computers. Now, why is this? Well, let's take a look at the biological data. There's not a single living thing on this planet that has a digital computer as a brain. They all have analog systems. Yet what we try to do in a lot of things like everything from artificial intelligence to even, even conventional robotics is try and mimic analog processes in digital domain. Well, this is sort of like the speed of light limit. I mean, um, we're already approaching that with our technology. The chances that we are also approaching the analog limit in digital technology means that I think that we are not going to be able to make competent full robot bodies that use just strictly digital electronics. So, I started doing all my evolution exactly upon that sort of basis. I started out with the simplest possible analog creature I could, and I have evolved from that device. From one creature up to over 200 interactive living machines, as we call them, inside my robot Jurassic Park. And that is my basic philosophy, and the technology that comes from that is because the robots evolve these things because they need them, not because I programmed it in. Uh, this is what now? Now, Walkman, okay, I'm going to turn off Walkman now. When Walkman started up, you notice he staggered for a fraction of a second, and within a step and a half, this animal uh, learned to walk. And this thing is not a toy in the sense that if it bangs into an object, it will adapt and try to find a way out toward a target, let's say, a source of light. It does this with no computers. It does this with a very small number of transistors. These are machines that are, are close to alive, as close as any machine has ever come to being alive. Um, they, they're survival platforms. Their only purpose in life is to survive. And so they, they are um, amazing animals. And this, this um, I call them animals because after a while you get to think of them as alive. And so Walkman, which is in free free space, doesn't doesn't do anything very interesting. But as soon as it comes in contact with the world, I can I can grab Walkman. I can unlike most robots, touch him. I can try to stop him from walking. He'll fight me. He adapts. He begins to change his gait. You can feel. You can feel. You can see. You can see his structure turn. It completely changes his behavior. So depending on, on the, the external world completes the architecture of this machine. He's now completely annoyed and he wants to get out of my hand because so he's flashing his lights to see where, where I am. Walkman and its cousins are driven by simple urges. They're often solar powered, so they seek out the life-giving rays of the sun. They are also inexpensive and relatively easy to build. Most of their parts are scavenged from discarded personal stereos, pocket calculators, and children's toys. 
Their low cost makes them expendable, but putting them out of action is easier said than done. These robots were built to take a beating. Tilden calls it bio-survivability. The concept of bio-survivability is one that I'm trying to get inside my machine. That is, you make a device which fights for its survival and then you can get doing a task for you later on. That is, you trick it into doing a task in the same way that you put blinders on an ox to get it to pull a plow, you stick special sensors on a robot to get it to cut the grass. But in all cases, it means that if you've got something like a robot that is chewed up by your dog, even though it's sick and hurt and damaged, its survivability still forces it to do a task, even if it's undergone real problems. And this is a real difference from sort of like standard digital techniques, which are like a bit flip and a wire cut away from the mobility. My robots can be horribly mangled, and they still do their job. These artificial animals lack higher brain function, but they're far from simple. They do a vast amount of calculating, but on a level so deep it approaches chaos. Chaos is a name for the underlying complexity that's built into the seemingly random patterns of nature. The mathematics driving this are difficult for most humans to grasp, but the result is a machine that functions more like a natural organism than a man-made construct. Uh, this is Snake. And Snake's the most unusual creature. It's actually quite frightening. I'm holding it now in, in my hand. And Snake is react. It can move along its length like a regular snake, but mostly it's not walking. This thing is, is moving through its environment by using modes of movement that biology, for the most part, did never implemented. So snake is really the first truly alien creature of this family of parallel life machines. And if you held it in your hands, you would see why. critical uh, arenas in which I think artificial life is really going to contribute is uh, in understanding uh, the way in which biological machines are engineered as opposed to the way that uh, we classically tend to engineer machines. On the scale of geological time, over which uh, uh, we typically uh, measure evolution, um, we are literally at now the end of one biological era and the beginning of a new one. Um, as soon as we attain the capability to actually synthesize life from scratch, whether it's in a beaker or in a computer or in a robot, uh, we will have introduced into the world a whole new lineage of life, one that was synthesized by human beings instead of having just uh, emerged uh, from nature. I'm going to bet that by, uh, by the year 2000 or within a decade of then, we will have built a machine that satisfies most of the criteria that biologists currently uh, apply to living organisms.